with all that's been said and done, I'm going to, I'm going to pass it on to Dan here. So everybody, again, thanks for coming. I'm going to try and do my best to, uh, to host or co-host as questions come in, if there are any, but Dan, man, enough. I've been chatting enough their ears off. Now. I'll let you take it. <laughs> Buddy, thanks. Uh, thanks, Turkey. Appreciate you having on. Lots of love to you and to everybody in the hockey community. I know this last, whatever it's been, 18, 20 months has been like unlike anything we've seen before. And I know that in these times, there is more opportunity in this game of hockey um, than ever before. And so I like to do a thing called tech check. So before we get started, can everybody that's on the call, just so I know you can hear me and that you can see me um, in, the, in the group chat right here, just drop your name in. Um, and, and text where you're calling, where you're, where you're joining us from, where you're, you know, what part of the world do I know? I know we've got a couple of the people that Turkey was saying from the Southern Hemisphere, but just drop in um, where you're from. And then, you know, Turkey's going to be the moderator for a bit of this. So if you have any questions, uh, fire them in there. And then, you know, time permitted at the end, we'll stick around and, and dig into uh, to any of those questions that you guys have. Um, you know, Turkey, man, I, I appreciate you and everything you do in the hockey community. I mean, you and I have spent a lot of time. I think you and I have gotten a lot closer in the last, uh, you know, eight, nine months um, in light of everything that's going on. And I think like attracts like. And, and when good people do good things, really, really good things happen. And so I know I'm on this call now supporting, you know, you and all the athletes that are that are calling in. Um, and I'm totally stoked to be here. And, and so. Uh, my name is Dan Blackburn. 23 years ago, I can't believe it, 20, almost a quarter of a century ago, um, I started working with hockey players uh, because I wanted to help them be better. I wanted to teach them how to see their greatness. And you see on the screen here on my first slide, um, and this is a mantra I live by, is that, you know, your greatness is not something you do. It's not something you win. It's not something you achieve. It's who you are as a person, as a man, as a woman, whatever age you're at, you have this inalienable greatness that's oozing from every every pore of your body the challenge is a lot of us forget about that or sometimes we've never been told we, we think that our greatness can only shine when we get the trophy and we we have those colossal wins and and don't get me wrong those are amazing um and um if you're waiting for that win that trophy that shining moment to define who you are there's a lot of players that play at the highest level on this planet that never win that trophy. And so if we're waiting for that crown jewel and you don't get it, well, then by default, the suggestion is that you're not great. I mean, it's, it's, it's bizarre. And so I'm going to talk to you tonight about your greatness right here in this moment, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter your age, no matter your gender, no matter how many times you've lost, how many times you've won, um, you have greatness that's coming from every part of your body. And so my story real quick, uh, this is little old Dan here on the left-hand side playing in the snow, snow banks in Montreal. This is uh, late, uh, well, I guess probably early 70s, maybe late 70s. Um, and I was like a lot of kids. I just was stoked. I was fired up to, to you know, be the best that I could. I wanted to play in the snow and shoot pucks and, and, and hopefully win a Stanley Cup one day. And, and over the course of my life, um, you know, there were more trials and tribulations. There were a lot of things that reminded me that um, that I wasn't great. And I bought into that for a period of time. And then on the right side here, this is me on stage. And anybody that knows TED Talks, you see that big red dot. Um, this was seven years in the making. This was probably my greatest moment of resiliency. Um, it took seven years to get to this moment on stage. I knew I wanted to speak. I knew I had something to share. I knew I had value to bring. And despite my best efforts, and, and I don't know how many players here can relate to this, you know, you call a coach, you go to a tryout, you train behind the scenes. You literally believe that you are the man or the woman. You're literally that missing piece that that team is looking for. And yet you don't get recognized. You don't get a chance. You know, you get turned away. You don't make the team again. You know, you're playing at a level below where you think you could be. Um, and it's in those moments, it's in those moments of darkness where we really begin to question our own possibilities, our own opportunities, our own greatness. And so I did a lot of that in a seven year period. I called, I reached out, I emailed, I texted, I called on favors. Anybody who was remotely connected to Ted Talk, TEDx, and, you know, Ted, Ted, Ted Smith, Ted Jones, guys I knew down the street that I grew up with, they had the name Ted. I was calling to see if maybe they knew someone uh, that could get me on stage. And it was crickets. And I was heartbroken. 
And so in the moment of being heartbroken, I still knew, like I never questioned my ability. I just went and started doing things that showed that, that really brought my greatness to the surface. And so I started donating my time. I started giving, I started being a value of service, not asking for something in return. And in theory, what I stopped doing was asking for a spot on the team. I stopped asking for a moment on the stage. And it was in those moments when I was showing up on this planet in my greatness that one woman saw me and she recognized that I had something unique, something, something special. And this is a testament to everybody out there. You know, we, you hear it set off and is it's, you know, there's someone always watching or you never know who's watching or in your darkest moments, someone's watching. And so you want to make sure that you continue to show up every day with your greatness because it's when that person's watching that you don't even know you're trying to impress. You don't even know that you're trying to get onto their stage or on their team. And this woman, Anna, contacted someone without me knowing. She contacted someone who was a coordinator of a TED Talk. And she said, if you're serious about inspiring youth, inspiring athletes, you need to have Dan Blackford on the stage. Because if you don't, then you're truly not serious about your event. And this woman calls me on a Friday afternoon. I'm in London, Ontario, Canada. And she says, Dan, I was given your name um, and I'd love for you to be, a, to be a, a speaker on the TEDx stage, right? Inside, like I came to life. But then here's the catch. She said, the problem is, it was a Friday afternoon. She says, the problem is the presentation, the TED Talk is taking place Monday. She said, are you ready? And my answer was, I've been ready for seven years. And so I didn't know that I was that my moment was coming. I just stayed ready. I did the work. I showed up every day. I, my belief system was as high as ever. And I refused to let the failure to affect or infect my belief, my opinion of myself. And I went on stage um, and crushed it. And so this moment for me, it was seven years in the making. I don't know how long you have been at it, um, but I wanna remind you that whether it takes seven days, seven months, seven years, or sometimes 70 years, your moment is coming. Your only job is to show up every day to be so locked into your greatness that when that moment comes, you can literally burst onto the stage and do what it is that you know you can do because that's one of the reasons that you're here. And so when I started working with athletes, you see David Bolin over here on the left, two-time Stanley Cup, won a Memorial Cup, won a World Junior um, in 05. Of course, P.K. Subban, most people know P.K. Um, you know, he continues to do amazing things in this planet. Um, you know, when PK was eight years old, I started working with him and he was the same, you know, grizzly, smiley, high energy guy, just, but imagine an eight year old version of what you see now. Uh, I don't know which had more energy back then or now, but he was like bouncing off the walls. And this exuberance, um, is one of the keys that self-belief he knew that in order to be successful, he had to be this bigger than life character and look at what he's achieved now. And then on the right side, Tyler Sagan started working with him when he was 13 um, and again, he's done incredibly successful things. And so I put these players up here to a show you what some of my path and journey has been at the same time, everybody that's watching, you are like all of these players. They started at some point where they had a little belief in themselves and that grew. And then they had a lot of people that maybe believed, maybe didn't. And as they navigated along their course, they continued to chase what they considered was their next level. Now I'm going to put this, this slide up here very quickly. And what I want to point to is we have five key areas in our lives. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight is the person on this call. I'm not interested in only talking to the hockey player because we now know that hockey players are more than the, the guy or the girl with a, with a stick and a good shot and a good skater or an average skater or a big body or little body. You, you are so much more than that. And thankfully in the hockey world, in the hockey community, we're starting to recognize more uh, of players than just the, you know, the X's and O's on the board. And so the five areas are health, career, family and friends, service, and then legendary army. Legendary army are the mass of people you have around you. Now, I won't have time to dig into all of this now, but I did want to preface this by saying that every single one of you, no matter where you are right now, there is a next level. The problem is most of us believe that the next level is some level like that we want to, that we have to get like one level higher in the hierarchy and the evolution of hockey. We think we need to get there in order to, to take our game to a new level or to get exposure to, to coaches and to teams. But the reality is your next level 
is different than the next level. And so I want you to write that down wherever you are now, write down that the next level is different than your next level. And today I'm talking to you about your next level. Because when you stack up your next levels, one on top of the other, year after year, for me, it was seven years in the making. Every single day, I was consistently rising to a new level for me. I didn't know if that level was ever going to be high enough to get me to walk out on stage for a TED Talk. But I do know that it was a stacking of all of those levels that opened up that door. And I can say the same is true for the hundreds and hundreds of players that I've helped either get to the NHL, the OHL, play college hockey, you know, continue to, to raise the bar on themselves in their career. And so think about this for the balance of what I'm going to share. Think about this as your next level, whatever it is. And I know there's coaches on this call. So maybe players, your next level is being a little bit better on the penalty kill. Maybe it's blocking one more shot. Maybe it's, it's finding a way to get into that shooting lane. Uh, to, to block one more pass. If you're a goaltender, maybe it's controlling that puck. So instead of just making the first save, you're thinking about how do I shape this puck so I can make the save and then control so I can always be one ahead of the play. Maybe it's communicating. Maybe you as a player, maybe you've got something to say to the team, to the coach, you've got ideas, you've got thoughts you can share, uh, but you're holding back because you feel awkward or you're not really sure if you're supposed to. And so whatever it is that you've got going on, um, every single one of us aspires and can get to our respective next level. And so the next level principle is this triangle, and it's broken down into three sections. And so at the top of it, we have acceptance. And so acceptance is looking at you in the mirror and accepting your greatness. You see, one of the challenges we have as humans, as athletes, is, is questioning our own greatness. I said at the start, if you know, the trophy above our head picture. Oh yeah, that was a moment when I achieved greatness. Well, the reality is the only way you got to that trophy was by being great day after day after day that eventually put you in a position to be on a team or be in an environment where you could grow and you could then play in that game, which then led to another game, which then led to a playoff, which led to a bunch of series wins. And then you got to step on the ice and play for that trophy. It was all of these little moments of greatness that led you to this moment of holding the cup above your head. And so what I'd like everybody to do is to draw this triangle on your page. And we use this a lot when I go into junior teams or um, a lot of time now as, as a player advisor, um, you know, I work with players and help them prepare for, again, their next level. And I'll often talk to them about, you know, what do you accept about yourself? And, you know, Jeff Skinner was a great example. I mean, he's, he's in Buffalo now and, and he won a Calder Trophy his first year in the NHL. And Jeff was always a small guy by everybody else's standards. Jeff saw that as an asset. So when I would do this exercise with him, he would say, what do I accept about myself? I accept that I'm small. Most people see that as a deficit. He says, I see that as an opportunity. The next thing Jeff saw about himself was he saw that he had skills and then lastly, he knew that having skills didn't matter as much as his ability to produce. And so when I would say to Jeff, you know, you're small, he'd say, that's okay. You know, sometimes you need to be small to fit into the small areas to get opportunities. He says, the puck is the same size to me as it is to everybody else on the ice. And he says, my job is simply to use my tools, my skills, my greatness to put myself in a position to be successful on that given night. What happens the night after? What happens six months from now? I haven't gotten there yet. I'm just gonna focus on the process of today of being the best that I can be, taking my size that I see as an advantage. I'm gonna work on my skills, mental skills, physical skills, emotional, and I'm gonna go on the ice and I'm gonna do my best to produce. And for him, scoring could be puck in the net, could be an assist, could be winning the battles on the faceoff, could be going into the rink and saying, tonight, I'm going to win 71% or more of my defensive zone faceoffs because the team we're about to play, when they have the puck, when they're in possession, they neutralize their opponent 50 to 60% of the time. So as long as we can have the puck, or at least I give our team a chance to have the puck, I know that I'm going to be steering the ship in the right direction. And so 
I would say to Jeff, you know, what is it if you look at your being small, if you believe that being small is, is, a, is a hindrance, how could that hold you back? And so I'm going to use this as an example. And anybody that's out there now, and if, if size is a factor, if you've been told or somehow you believe that, that size is going to be your reason why you won't achieve, um, you know, Turkey will tell you some stories of number 11 in Montreal and countless other players who are not six foot two and 215 pounds. Um, and and they've, they've done some pretty good stuff on and off the ice. And so I would say to Jeff, I said, just for imagine for a second, what would happen if you allowed your size to hold you back? How would that affect you as a player? And so he used to say to me, he says, well, he says, my self-belief would be down the drain. Like he says, the moment I subscribe, the moment I buy into someone else's ideology, that I know that I'm putting myself at a massive, massive disadvantage that the other guy on the other team, he doesn't even need to play well. When, when Jeff doesn't believe in himself, and I, and I say this to everybody on the call, if you don't believe in yourself, you don't need the other team to be great. You don't need them to be exceptional. You are literally giving them an advantage before the puck even drops. The other thing Jeff used to say that if he, if he sat back and said, geez, you know, small is really going to affect me. He would literally see hockey, his games as a dead end. He knew that, that if he bought into this story, this, this pragmatic opinion that size does matter, then he said, Dan, I, I can't control. Like, like, here's the thing. Like, like, there are some things in your life you can control. There's some things you can't. The stuff you can't control, if you give that one second of thought, if you wish it could be different, if you try to wrestle that demon, if you want to try and change that, if it's something out of your control, you're literally wasting your time. And for Jeff, he would literally see himself, as he used to call it, painting himself into a corner or walking down the road on a dead end street and wondering why there was no opportunity beyond that cul-de-sac or the end of the road. And so when you subscribe to someone else's opinion, when you allow their thoughts, their ideas, their, their beliefs of what is and what isn't supposed to be, when you, when you believe that more than you believe your own truth, then you're no longer in acceptance. You are now along for the ride. And now that becomes the slippery slope where we're wishing it was different. How come? Why me? We play the victim. And literally the game and us, we literally start to slide down this hill no matter how hard we try. We physically can't get up. So I used to say to Jeff, well, what's the one thing you can change about your self-belief? And he used to say that every day is a day to grow. And so I want you to think about that for a second. Every day is a day, is a chance that I can grow. And I don't know what you've got down on your sheets when you're looking at your self-belief. When I'm talking about acceptance, it's about looking yourself square in the face in the mirror and recognizing that whether there's a part of you that you love, that you, you know is your asset, or maybe there's a part of you that, that you know is hurting you, is affecting you, is literally sucking the life out of you. What would happen if you looked in that mirror and you said, you know what, what despite my assets and liabilities, today is a day that I can grow, that I can move from this place and I can create something. When it was for me, I was of service. I was working. I was helping children that had life-threatening illnesses. I was helping children that were terminally ill. I was helping the Subans and the Tavarises and the Sagans of the world, but I was also helping players who probably were never, ever going to get out of a hospital. They were probably going to spend their dying days in a hospital, lung transplant. I worked at the, uh, I volunteered at the hospital for sick children here in, in Toronto in the nephrology ward. And, and you couldn't go in some of their rooms without, without literally washing yourself down, putting hazmat suits, suits on because their risk of infection was literally life or death. And so I used to look at those amazing families and think every day those families are getting up and they're looking at themselves in the mirror and they're saying today's a chance to grow grow my relationship grow my connection grow my love for one another so i don't know what it is that you're working on what you accept of yourself but if you stopped letting that piece be the thing that holds you back imagine how much power 
you could bring into the world. And when I have a player that's on the road or he's, he's out of tryout and, and, and he's a guy that I'm advising and really helping him move to his next level and he calls and he's having a tough time. The number one thing I come back to is like, what do you accept about yourself? What do you accept about this moment? And the other thing Jeff used to say is the fact that I can play the game that I love, that in itself is a massive win. And, and it's interesting when I think about that now, like how true that is, you know, 18 months ago, 16 months ago, 15 months ago, 12 months ago, nine months ago, six months ago, there were a lot of us on this globe that didn't have access to hockey the way we've always had it, the way we wish we could have it. And so when you get up now and you look at yourself in the mirror, you accept that part of yourself, that part of you that is great, your uniqueness. You see, the thing that makes you unique is literally one of your superhero superpowers. It's literally the thing that makes you special that can literally be the difference maker in a game, in a situation, on the ice, and in your life. And so Jeff knew that being small was an advantage because people would look at him with a different perspective of, oh, he won't be much of a challenge. He won't be difficult to defend against. And yet his skill and his scoring ability was so high that people underestimating him was a massive, massive advantage. So for you, for everybody on the call, what is the thing that you can accept about yourself? And then if you allow that to hold you back, imagine what the outcome would be. You don't need a coach to tell you you can't make the team. You don't need a coach to, make, to tell you you can't be on the power play. Like You don't need all the negativity in the world when your negativity is the loudest and most profound in your head. And so imagine if you flip the switch, what could you commit to, to changing that story so that you could start to see that part of you, that uniqueness as a gift, as something that was going to have you stand out in a crowd and was going to give you mileage and opportunity that you would never have before. And so then, so acceptance is owning your greatness. The next piece, participation, is now how are you going to walk in the world with that greatness? You get up in the morning, you look at yourself in the mirror, you see a part of yourself that you've either criticized or judged or maybe sort of celebrated. And you're like, you know what? Today, I'm going to embrace that part of me. I'm going to love on myself more than anybody else on this planet. Because I believe that when you believe in you as much as you want others to believe in you, success comes to find you. Like You don't have to go and get it. It's not the effort, the work. It's not the hill you have to climb to get to the top to get success. When you're out there living your life, believing in you more than anybody else, success literally comes running down the street, screaming, begging for you to grab hold and for it to be a part of your life. And so how do you participate in your life right now as an athlete, as an individual, a brother, a sister, a teammate, a friend, a colleague, a parent, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, a coach, a player to a coach, a coach to a coach? How do you show up on the planet every single day that brings your greatness you see this thing in the morning you put it on your backpack and you walk down the street with this with this strength with this assertion this belief that no matter what happens in the world you got this thing inside of you that you accept about yourself and that is the change maker that piece you have is the difference maker for the places and the people that you're about to meet and so for jeff when he would look at himself, okay, I'm a little bit small and I have all these difficulties that people say I should buy into, but for me, I'm going to grow every single day. For him, he was going to show up with a smile. Whether it was a win or a loss, whether someone had something good or bad to say about him, and you look at Jeff now and you see him in Buffalo, even though last year was a, was a real tough year for that team and the year before with season being caught with COVID, you see Jeff, he's still got a smile on his face. The second thing is he's going to make sure he's the hardest worker hardest worker in the room when you walk into the gym when you see a guy like Jeff training or skating he's you know like he's the guy like you want to follow someone someone's bandwidth someone's ability to to take their game to a different level Jeff is the guy that's going to show up every day and the last thing is he's going to be a student Jeff one summer he took a job because he wanted to learn how to score against goalies and so what he figured out was in his mind was if he could score against a six foot one butterfly, traditional right-handed goalie, if he could find a weakness in that goalie, 
then he wondered, maybe is that a weakness that is synonymous with every six foot one butterfly traditional right-handed goaltender? And so he went the entire summer and sure enough, a couple of goalie stations later, anybody that's been to a, a goalie camp and a shooter, you got these stations all over the place. And then he would, wow, that same weakness on that same, on another goalie, same, same parameters, same height. I scored on him again, low blocker, low blocker. Wow, I'm starting to realize that that is a real challenge for goalies that size. And then he would find a left-handed goalie. Then he would find a goalie that was less butterfly. And he continued to build this repertoire in his mind because he knew if he continued to be a student in the game, remember, his asset was to score, was the skill. And so he was going to continue to become the greatest student in the room. So he was constantly absorbing. So he was always one step ahead. And sure enough, when he played in the OHL in Kitchener, he would get on the ice and he would go through pregame and he'd do his stretches and he'd look down at the other end of the rink and he'd see the goalie that was in there. And before the game started, he already knew where the high percentage chance of scoring was. And so when he got into a scoring position, he played the odds and most times it worked in his favor. In fact, he scored 54 goals uh, in Kitchener. It's one of the reasons why he got drafted to Carolina in the, in the first round. And so he was constantly being a student of the game, no matter how good he was, whether he was the best player on the team or the worst. He showed up every day, he sat at the front of the class, had his pen, had his paper, and he was ready to learn to soak up as much as he could. And if he didn't understand, he was constantly asking questions. So I said to Jeff, I said, what, were some, what are some things you could change about your game that could have you show up with even more power, more emphasis, more drive? And he said the one thing for him was that when he would come, well, when he would come in as a student, um, hold on, Boom. Awesome. When he would show up as a student, he always knew that it was about his preparation. So he always wanted to know where he was going, what was the purpose, what was he going to be learning. So for him, preparation. Preparation. What is it that you can do today that can, with your assets, with your gifts, that you can walk in the world and you can be not only the best student, but you can be the best prepared athlete, the best prepared student for the game. What's the environment going to look like? What are they going to ask of you? What are all the little tiny details that you can learn? The second thing that Jeff would work on is details. You know, I talked about his finite skills to score. You know, he knew that when he was attacking the offensive zone, it was his ability to cheat just enough that he'd be on side, but that he could put himself in a position to score by maybe beating that defenseman who's flat footed. And, you know, I don't have to tell anybody um, other than, than Turkey here, when, when you're talking about shooting the puck, it's always in the little tiny details. It's the position of your feet. It's your arms. It's what you're doing. It's what you're doing with your arms. Not so much, you know, how much is your stick or what's the flex or all these other things that we talk about. Jeff wants to get more granular to really get clear on how can he figure out the tiniest detail so that he can be constantly ahead of the game. And so I don't know what it is that, that you're working on right now when we talk about the acceptance and the participation. How can you show up with your gifts? Remember, greatness is, sorry, acceptance is owning your greatness and participation is walking out in the world with them knowing, like owning them, knowing that they are going to be the game changer for you and possibly for other people. And then this brings me to the last piece, contribution. Look, you have uniqueness inside of you. You have gifts. Every single player on this call, you have gifts that can completely change your team, change your environment. In some cases can change this planet. And so what are those gifts that you have that you can show up with every single day to make your team better and also make you a better teammate. And so for Jeff, it's share, share the gifts, share the details. Not everybody's going to want to know the details. That's okay. But there might be one player on the ice who is thirsty, who is hungry, who wants to know what those details are, and they will be willing to listen, to hear, to be a part of whatever it is that you're learning that you can share them. The next one was contribution. was to consistently bring his gifts to the surface. So a goal scorer, oftentimes you get criticized. Oh, he's a puck hog. Oh, he should pass the puck. Well, of course he scored 54 goals. You know how many times he could have passed the puck and he should We're going to hear all of this. 
But because Jeff believed he accepted so strongly in his ability to score, to produce, he worked so hard to find out all the details, to be the hardest worker in the room. When he would step out on the ice, he knew that he could use his gifts to not only make the team be better, but ultimately to make himself be better. And so what is it that you can do? And maybe there's something you're holding back on. You know, what gift, what part of, of your greatness that you accept that you just wrote down here tonight, which part of that do you hold back on? Do you not share with the world? Do you not, you know, throw at center court or drop at center ice? You know, the old, that old mic drop, drop moment. So many of us hold back because we're, well, you know, like, I don't want to be too loud. And, you know, I don't want to make too much of a, of a, of a presence. I just, just let me, just let me go with the flow. Just let me fit in. And I say to players all the time, like, you're not on this planet. You're not at this tryout. You're not training all summer. You're not on this team just to fit in. You're here to contribute, to make your team and to make yourself better. And so what are your gifts? That greatness that you have, maybe, maybe you make the best pregame playlist of all time. I mean, maybe you're literally the best music person on the team. Maybe you're a first-year player. Maybe you're not on the power play. Maybe you're not on the penalty kill. Maybe you're not there yet. But maybe you do something. Maybe you're the first one in the room that literally sets the mood, that sets the tone, that the other players walk in. And when they see you there, they're like, oh, man, like, it's, it's go time. Like, when, when Bobby's here or when Jenny's here, like, it's go time. Like, like if they're here, then – everybody's ready to go. Like, what is that? What is that trend? What is that statement that you make day in, day out that has other people look at you? If I was to take seven or eight or nine of your teammates or, or 13 of your classmates or your brother, your sister, your next door neighbor, if I was to ask your dog, tell me about little John or tell me about Joni, what would they say about you? And if they're saying anything other than your greatness that you know you just accepted you just owned it if they give you a response that it's anything other than that then that's proof that you're not living in that greatness you're holding back you're keeping in your pocket you're afraid to be too loud pk Subban, as i said before he gets criticized all the time i watch the stuff on social i mean he gets carved all the time and and yet all pk wants to do is get better every single day be the best teammate he can possibly be and give as much to the next generation as he can possibly give. Like, does he want to win? Of course he does. Does he, does he put himself at the front of the line sometimes? Of course he does, which you all should. And yet every single day for PK, it's about how can I serve and show up and be the best example I can be for the next generation, for the next little mini PK that's watching who may not believe in him or herself, but because they see PK doing his stuff that they're like, you know what? I think I can. Well, I'm telling you right now, it doesn't matter what level you are at. You have that same ability. You can have that same impact on players on your team by being your greatest version of yourself, by contributing from a place of truth, a place of strength, where you walk into a room, you walk into your classroom, you walk into your house, and you're like, you know what? This is all of me. I'm going to shine every beam of light that I can possibly shine to everybody that's in this room. And then I used to say to Jeff, what's one way you can contribute more in this category? And so I want everybody to think about that. If you're, if you've got yourself, if you're yet, you know, you believe you're contributing, maybe you're at a, maybe you're at a seven, a seven out of 10, maybe you're an eight out of 10, maybe you're an 8.3 out of 10. What do you need to do to step up to become a 9.7 out of 10 or a 9.3? three out of 10 in terms of your ability to contribute more of your greatness. Because when you accept who you are and you walk around, like you own it, and then you pass it on to other people to learn, to grow, you're literally planting a tree every single day of your life. That is going to bear fruit. That's going to grow into something that's impact. That's what every single great player, every great person on this planet, what they do is they impact others. When I was out doing my Ted talk, I'm just, doing my thing. I'm impacting this woman so much so that she's putting her neck on the line, telling other people that if you don't have Dan Blackman on your stage, you are literally not committed to running the best possible show you can. And so people are watching. So Jeff used to say, one of the things that he can do around share, sharing his gifts is ask others of their, 
opinion. So I would like all of you to ask your teammates, ask your brother, ask your sister, say, listen, here's what I believe is my uniqueness. I walk out in the world. I'm going to, I'm going to carry this in my backpack from this point forward. I heard Dan Blackburn talk last night. And, and I know that this one thing that sometimes I accept about myself, or sometimes I don't accept it because I think it's a bad thing. But from this point forward, you're going to look at yourself in the mirror and you're going to accept the greatness of who you are, whatever it looks like, you're going to own it. You're going to walk out in the world. You're going to shine it to every person you can. And I want you to ask the people in your life that you care about, ask them what their opinion is of your sharing of that gift and listen to them. And if they say, yeah, you know what? You're a 7.2. You know, last night you were a 9.3. And then you think back and you're like, well, last night I had the best game of the year. Or, or last night I had the, my math test was so easy. I breathed through it. I thought I failed it. It was so easy. I found out I got a nine out of 10. And so you'll start to look back and think, you know what? Those times when I'm literally shining my greatness to the world, my gifts, my, my whole game, my level, remember the next level principle, my new level is way up here. And it's like, wow, I never realized that all I needed to do was to bring more of me to the table, like honest, sincere, like my truth, bring it to the table. Maybe, maybe your honesty, maybe your gift is being more quiet, is being more chill, is sitting in the room and listening to a certain type of music that has you get into a groove. And, and maybe a teammate looks at you and says, yeah, this, this loud music, man, I, it doesn't help me. I need to chill. And like, well, come on over here. Let's, let's share the earbuds. Let's listen together. And maybe that's the light that you shine. But ask your teammates, ask your family, ask the people that you care about, pick between three and five people, ask them what their opinion is of your gift sharing. And if it's anything below an 8.5 or a nine, then I would encourage you to invest more time, more effort, more energy into that. Don't worry about trying to be something you're not. Don't worry about trying to climb a mountain that, that is down the road and that everybody's got to get to. And if you climb, get to the mountain one step at a time and all these cliches, don't worry about that tonight. Just focus on how can you show up with that gift, with more fire, with more passion, and see how that changes your game, changes your life, changes your interaction with people. It will literally change your presence. This is how we shift our confidence. This is how we start to take a, an opinion of someone saying you're too small to a place of, damn right, I'm too small. I, like, I'm, I'm too small. So they say, okay, I'm going to own that. And then what am I going to do? I'm going to go in the world and I'm going to work on my skill. I'm going to work on the thing that I can because I can't work on my height. I'm either going to hit puberty and grow or I'm not, or I'm going to be six foot two, or I'm going to be five foot nine. Like, I don't know what I'm going to be, but I know one thing I can control is I'm going to work on my skill. I'm going to accept that part of me that I have this ability to work hard, be the hardest worker in the room. And I'm going to produce somehow, some way. I don't know what the production is going to look like scoring face-offs win, penalty kill. If you're a goaltender, save percentage, puck control, rebound control, whatever it is, you're going to work on all of that. And then you're going to walk out into the world. Once you, own this greatness, and you're going to start to pass it forward. Like Tim said to me at the start of today, he's passing the baton on to me. Well, you're going to start to pass the baton on to other players. And when you do this, particularly when you're in a team environment, you'll see how this becomes almost like, like an infection. It becomes this, this, this pattern where other players are like, whoa, geez, Dan, Dan's really like living kind of in his greatness. And man, he's been playing solid the last two weeks. Well, Maybe I'm going to try a little bit of what he's doing. And so remember, Jeff talked about sharing. So someone's going to say, Dan, you're, you're on fire, man. You know, or a coach says to me, Dan, I don't know what you're doing. But dude, man, you are on fire. And then I'm going, to, I'm going to own it. I'm going to say, well, here's what I did. I took the next level principle, and I'm literally owning that every single day. And coach is going to say, uh, the next level, what? What are you talking about? Let me show you. Let me show you. Oh, well, well could you show the whole team? Sure, I'm going to show, okay, let me take this triangle. Let me show acceptance, participation, contribution. Maybe this becomes your gift. Maybe you become the custodian of this message and you pass it on. Maybe you reach out to me. You have me come and speak to your team. But you literally become this change agent that creates a different flow, a different presence on the team because you are willing to share your gifts. You are willing to open up and beam that light of your uniqueness because you own it, because you know it's powerful. 
And that is how we share greatness with the world. And that is how we become the most confident player on the ice. Booyah. Well, do we have any, anybody have any questions? I'd be happy to, if anybody even wanted to like have me, you know, if someone wanted to throw out their, you know, what's the thing they they accept about themselves that they may be seen as a liability or they, they didn't really know it was something that could be like a springboard or catapult them into, into unlocking their greatness. I'd be happy to, uh, to, uh, yeah, to, to, to support anybody on here that wants, you know, that wants some direction. You know, I say to players all the time, it doesn't matter what age you are, whether you're eight or nine. Remember I started, you know, teaching this stuff to, to Subban and the guys when they were eight years old, nine years old. This is, this is about changing the way we look at things. And, and, you know, we can do it at any age. You know, maybe you're a coach on here and you're, you're 38 years old and, and you, you know, you realize you've been holding back. You realize you've been buying into some story that someone told you one time, but the, you know, you, you can only get to a certain level. I mean, Ken Hitchcock never played uh, above house league. You know, and he wins a Stanley Cup. And, you know, he used to say, like, people used to tell him all the time, you're overweight, you can hardly skate. What do you know about hockey? You never even played. And he just was like, well, I'm just, I'm going to show up next year and I'm going to do the best I can and, and trying to help the boys win. And, and you know, the rest is history. Um, Mike Benelli said here, Dan, what are some good strategies to help players help each other in the room? Um, Mike, maybe, maybe if you want to unmute yourself, give me a little more context. Um, you know, what are the ages of the players? And specifically, what are you looking for for help is it more team, yeah, more team yeah. harmony my question is really more about you know how to player how can players help each other and support each other in the room to make you know to find these strategies you know say they see a player that might not have that confidence level that inner drive how can other players help that player amazing great question so mike to you to, to any of the co other coaches out there uh, you know one of the ways that i would say is is take this Take the next level principle, even if you broke it down in bite-sized pieces and you said to the players, listen, what do you just do the acceptance piece on, on, a, on a given day, on a practice? You get a team together and ask them, what, what do you accept about yourselves? And you get the players to put it up on the wall and, and talk about it openly. And it's amazing how when, when we're honest about ourselves, it's amazing how our teammates want to rally around us. And I know as hockey players, we're great at chirping and you know, we're great at at all that fun stuff. But, you know, really that's, that's a, a form of endearment. It's, it's, it's really how we endear each other to each other. And at the same time, we, we also want to be there for each other and support and help. And so I would say, start off with the acceptance piece, get players to really like, what is the gift? Like, what is the thing that you either buy into as, as you see as your greatness or the thing that you've been told um, is not valuable, is, is going to be the, your nemesis. It's going to be your Achilles heel and talk about it. And it's amazing, you know, when someone says, hey, you're, so I, I'll give you a real life example. So um, Jeff Skinner was, this is like the Jeff Skinner night. I didn't, I didn't plan it to go that way. But the first time I coached Jeff, everybody had told me he was a high maintenance guy. And, and here's what I know is that people that believe in themselves can be perceived as high maintenance people because they're always on. There's like, you'd show up to the rink and Jeff was there. He was there for a purpose. He was there to, yeah, he was going to have a few laughs and, and, and a good time, but he was there to get better. He was there to practice. He was there to prepare for the next day. And so when Jeff played, he wanted to score. He wanted to contribute. And so people are telling me he's high maintenance. The first night we play, it's a tight game. A game ends 2-2. With less than a minute to go, Jeff has the game on his stick, in his opinion, um, he's a bit of a sharp angle. He misses the net. The puck caroms around, goes to the neutral zone. No one ever really gets possession. The game ends in a tie. It was a great moral victory for us because we were down 2 nothing. We scored two goals in the third. Um, but I go in the room. Jeff is the first guy in the room after the game, and he is in the corner. He's inconsolable. His tears are, are – he's, he's, so, he's so upset that he's inconsolable, Mike. And I said to him um, – you know, first, Jeff, are you okay? And, you know, he can, he can hardly catch his breath. And he says, yeah. And the players look around at me, like waiting for me to say something. And I said to the guys in the room, I said, when everybody in this room cares this deeply about even one part of your game, you will be better players and we will be a better team. And so the message I sent to the players was, I want you to be all you can be. I want to know your truth. I want to know your, 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 your dark. I want to know your light. I want to know it all because, because we are going in the trenches together. We are going to be battling together. The more we know each other, 
the more we can be there for each other. And I also wanted Jeff to know that in that moment of tears that he had been embarrassed and he had been judged about, I wanted to let him know that all of him is acceptable in here, all of it. And to all the players, all of you is also acceptable because you all have a gift that you can bring to the table. So Mike, I would start off with an exercise where you ask the players, what do you accept about yourself? And just allow the players to, to, to take the conversation um, to their truth. And you'll see it'll slowly start to break down the, the walls. First, you know, there'll be some sort of fun, superficial, and then eventually the players will get more and more honest. And I've done this with teams as young as nine years old. And I've done this with, you know, with, with players in the OHL. And, and it's amazing. So once we tear down the walls of who we think we're supposed to be and talking about the part of us that we don't think is going to be accepted and, and really showing or revealing our truth, it's amazing how we can then use that as a building block to, to really be seen and to see each other. And in that vulnerability, like in that truth, that's where we find our strength for each other. When I, Mike, when I know when something happens and I know it affects you and I know that when it affects you, it takes the wind out of your sail, I'm going to be on guard. And the moment I see that, that scary thing coming down the road that I know might affect you, I'm going to, I'm going to like move over to, you. I'm going to block it. I'm going to, cause I'm going to be aware that that thing gets my, my teammate, my family member, Mike, and I'm going to stand with them. And so it slowly begins to reveal the intention um, and the purpose of players, which is supporting each other, working towards and for each other so that they can all show up and work for the, for the name on the front of the Jersey, but also to respect and honor the name on the back of the Jersey. That's awesome. You know what? I got a question. Yep. You know, one of the things that we've spoken about, I've done a few uh, coaching presentations and seminars over COVID over a long period of time. One of the questions that comes up a lot is, is time allocated or planning and what skill or what component or category how much time should you allocate to something like this? You know, like when you, you know, you have your skill stuff, you have your preparation, and then obviously the on ice stuff, the coaches have so much plans that, that they're doing where, you know, they have to work on special teams. They got to work on breakout transition plays, zone entries, breakouts, all that stuff. So what, what do you think uh, you could tell the coaches, Dan, that that would be, you know, an idea of how much time you should spend on, on getting your players to self-believe or, you know, creating that, that time that, that, that they need to hear this kind of stuff. Great. Yeah. Great question. And so I, I would say it this way. It's something we need to do consistently. The players that I advise, um, we, I support them to do it every day and it can be, it could be a three minute practice, the start of the day. And if, if we're starting with the next level principle, I'll say to them, what do you accept about yourself today? Like text me in the morning. What's one thing you accept about yourself? And, and then if that player calls me at 10, 15 or 11 or noon, and he's like, dude, I'm, I'm healthy today. I'm not even like I'm scratched. And my girlfriend's coming to watch and her mom is coming to watch. She just flew in from Duluth and they're here to watch me. And if he hasn't texted me, I say to him, what do you accept about yourself? No, 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 Dan, I'm upset. I said, I get it. But first things first, what do you accept about yourself? And, and so it becomes, it becomes um, a practice for us as leaders, as coaches, that can literally just go around the room and say to the players, what do you accept about yourself? It, it, it just becomes your mantra. As much as, you know, when I, when I coach, I put a pre-practice routine up. I put it on the, on the board. The players come in. They know what to look for. Like, I'm building the rituals and habits of the team as a leader. And so I'm now going to add in this ingredient. Okay, guys, girls, what's one thing you accept about yourself? And once we're good at it, it take, like, it's like in 30 seconds. And in fact, I'll get players that'll say, okay, okay can, can I coach? Can I, can I tell you what I'm great? Can I, can I tell you? Can I tell you what I'm, when I accept of myself? Like they're, like they're going first. And I say this to coaches all the time. We don't know what players go through when they're not with you. We like to believe that they live in harmonious, loving, um, divine environments where there's lots of food in the fridge, good quality food. They've got a good quality bed to sleep in. Um, but we don't know that. And, and I know from experience, there's players that, that 
can, can come from the opposite of all of those things. And so I really believe it's our, it's our responsibility as coaches, as leaders to shine these little nuggets of light because that one player may have been sitting on their piece of acceptance all day long, maybe for three days since your last practice. And they're dying to tell you it. And it's the one time when we don't check in with them and we don't make it a priority because, because we lost and because we're angry and today we're going to bag skate them. And, and because we're so caught up in the emotion of the win, the loss that we forget about the greater good of serving these players to, to un, unlock their greatness within them. And so it's as simple as saying, okay, Joni, what do you accept about yourself? And the sheer fact that they can do that. And I see someone else wrote here, like, how can, how can you connect your brain to your physical skills, to your hands during a game? The number one skill that we must develop in our players is confidence, confidence in who they are as people that we see them, that we recognize them. And so by acknowledging who they are. And so uh, Connor wrote that down, Connor M. So this is for you, Connor. I don't know what you're like when you're nervous, but this, this is not just like a mental thing. I'm talking your central nervous system literally vibrates your, your, your heart rate, your heart rate variability. Like I'm talking at a cellular level. When we are nervous, when we're worried about failure, we're judging ourselves, we've got shame, we've got guilt. When we have all that stuff going on, it's not just about, you know, ripping on the guy because he didn't hold a stick right. It's like sometimes we can't even hold the stick let alone hold it right, let alone think about what we're doing. And so Connor, for you, and, and this is also, you know, answering uh, the question, you know, to, to you as well, Tim, it comes down to the daily practices, the little things that we're doing to slowly change the patterning, change the wiring of what we say to ourselves, why we say it and what we make it mean. And so every day, go in the room before a game, before practice, pick one thing, that really stands out to you from the next level principle. And you could say to the players, what did, you, what did you bring in your backpack today? What's the one thing? What's your one piece of greatness, your one gift that you carried with you all day today? It could be that simple. And, and you'll see kids, the athletes, you know, and I say kids, I mean, even at 22 and 20 years old, they're, it's like Christmas morning. What, once they know that this is going to be a regular thing, they can't wait to share it. Like they can't wait to unwrap that gift and, and tell you what it is. You know, that, that's, that leads into the, the question from Christina, how when we have to try and recognize and make sure that we are there as coaches for the players, like this is, man, I'm so grateful to be able to share this information. So she says, how can we get parents on board? To keep yeah, them from, Christina. like, cause it, cause they're draining self-esteem sometimes, you know, like, 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 that's a great point Christina brings up. It's, it's like, you know, mostly like the players, the athletes are spending more time with their parents than they are with their coaches. So we have to have to help them that way too with the parents. What do you think? hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, Christina, the reality is, you know, like I said it before, the, the things we can control, the things we can't control, um, you know, we, we can't control what parents are going to do and what kids environment is going to be like. I mean, if we see something, that's egregious or something that jumps out at us. Um, you know, having a conversation with the parent, pulling them aside, just letting them know, you know, letting them know what you're working on. You know, like maybe it's something saying, listen, the parents, you see them, you know, barking at their son or daughter because they, you know, they're not, I don't know, back checking or they're not doing something in the offensive zone the way that, that they think they should. And, you know, you can pull the parent aside and say, listen, here's what we're working on. You know, right now we're working on the acceptance and, and I'm asking Joni or, or Johnny to do this particular thing in the offensive zone. So it's really important that you support me. Um, Cause if not, it's, it's, it's only going to affect Johnny or Joni. They're going to be confused. They want to appease you. And at the same time, they want to appease me. And so at least when they're here with us, let us lead the way. Um, yeah. And, and, and yeah, and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. And, and I'll, I'll tell you this, Christina, you know, consistency is, is the model that changes behavior. And, and sometimes the sad, the sad reality is that sometimes we are in competition um, with a parent or an environment or a family that's, that's gripped by addiction or other illnesses that, that are affecting the entire family um, and the entire family's unwell. And so the, 
nine hours a week that you have Joni or Johnny, um, it's, it's so important that you remain consistent and, and true and connected to, to your value proposition, whatever you're bringing to the table. For me, it was this stuff, next level principle. It's all these tools. Um, maybe there's something else for you, um, but, but make sure that you are the model of consistency because, because by you being not consistency, if there's dysfunction in the family, there will be a breakdown of consistency. And kids, young people, even us as adults, we're really good at getting locked into consistency and buying into it wholeheartedly. And so it's almost like this, this competition between your consistency and the consistency that little Johnny or Joni's getting when they're not with you. So make sure that yours is all it can be um, and, uh, and, and you'll have a fighting chance at getting through to that player um, and giving them an experience that, that the, here's the reality, like your experience could literally change their lives. Like it could literally alter the course of their lifetime, which then alters the course of their children. And now we're talking generational change. Like this isn't, this isn't superficial stuff. Like this is, this is life changing and generational changing commitment. And so I applaud you for asking that question, Christina. And yeah, be the, be the most, be a consistent beast um, on the things that you know matter to you and bring value and the players will, will gravitate to it and, and they'll, um, they'll, they'll own it. So, uh, so Dan W. Blackburn um, is my Instagram. I'm on there all the time. You can also get me uh, at the same um, address on Facebook and then NTC Hockey um, is where you can get me. I've got the TikTok, NTC Hockey, and also Instagram there. And so if you want to reach out, you know, Christina, uh, oh, you're, you're, yeah, thanks for that. That's great. Um, and yeah, so feel free to reach out. Like I said at the start, you know, I mean, for 23 years, I've been helping hockey players achieve at every level. And, and it's, I'm so honored when I have a chance to come and speak to an audience of, you know, of new people. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a player advisor and I work very closely with families and players to really help them get over the hump and build a lot of these things. And to Christina's point, a lot of time when I do the advising, when I get in with the family, I'm advising like Mr. and Mrs. Smith as much or more than little Johnny Smith. And so it's, um, it's a great gift. Um, that I get when I have the opportunity to come in and, and support a family and support a player. Um, and at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm, I do this work on the planet. And so we train athletes. We've got an incredible training facility. NTC hockey is our facility here um, in the Toronto area. So if anybody's in the GTA, hit me up, be happy to have you come in and, and meet you and, and, uh, and see if, if, you know, if we can, can serve you and be a value that way. And everything I talked about today in the next level principle, there's also a way that we can work together online, no matter where you are around the world. And so we've, we, you know, again, we talk about pivoting. I, acceptance for me, one of my acceptance is my creativity, my ability to think outside the box, outside the lines. When I started training athletes back in 1997, people told me I was crazy. They laughed in my face. And I figured, you know what, just because no one was training hockey players the way I did didn't mean that it didn't work. It just mean that I hadn't been on the scene yet. So I walked in the world every day, owning the fact that I was different, I was unique, and I was going to continue to serve. And anybody that knows me, when I walk into a room, you know I'm there and you know I've been there, much like you've experienced tonight. And I don't apologize for that. And so I continue to serve. And so at the start of COVID, I thought, how can we serve our people the people we know and love and the people we know and love, but we haven't yet met. And so we started an incredible online community where we're coaching players. We give them training programs. We've got an incredible training app. I mean, we literally cover every facet of the player development um, model. And so we have a lot of teams and a lot of individuals from across the planet, you know, from, from Belgium, from Western Canada, from Sweden. I mean, it's, it's incredible The you know, from, from Slovakia, I mean, it, it's all over the U S all over Canada. And so we're, you know, we're honored to be able to serve. So if anybody's interested in something like that, would like to know more. I know Mike, you're here with your team. So if there's something that the way that I could serve you moving forward, uh, please message me and uh, I'd be happy to, to talk about, you know, yourself or your team and, um, and talk about ways that I can, uh, I can serve you. Thanks a lot, man. Booyah, guys. Booyah. Let us, let us shut her down. We'll talk. See you later, everybody. Okay, Thanks take care, everybody. Coming. Have a great night. All the best.